We've got a lot of problems with mold in our new houses, whereas our old houses didn't really have these problems, except if they've been renovated with the new techniques we use today. And then they have worse problems than even the new ones. Here's our old wall. This is our, let's say, pre-1930 wall. On the outside, we've got wood siding. We've got possibly just like a plank version of uh, what we would use OSB sheeting for today. It's just planks on the outside of the house. Might be shiplap, might be tongue and groove. Here's our stud. Our stud bay is empty. There's nothing in it. It could have been insulated, but from the houses I've seen, they're usually not, all right? And then on the inside, we usually got a layer of lath, which is just little strips of wood nailed to the wall for the plaster to cling to. And this was a lime-based plaster, all right? Now, let's take a look at the new wall and let's see what the differences are. All right, starting from the outside, we've usually got what? We got a vinyl-based siding here. Vinyl, by far the most common siding I see going on today. Then we've got a layer of house wrap, usually Tyvek, but if you had a little more in your budget, maybe you did the zip system, those green sheets that have a, a built-in vapor management system, All right? Then we've got our layer of sheathing, which is almost always OSB, oriented strand board, the ground up chips that are glued together and put in four by eight sheets. Then we move on to what's inside of our wall. We've got to have insulation now because one of the biggest things that has changed since 1930 is our energy codes. These old houses did not do a good job of staying the temperature we wanted them to. So we added insulation. So here I've got our pink fiberglass insulation in there. And then maybe it's got a paper facing on the inside. I'm here in the Midwest. That's how we do it here. It goes on the inside. And then we've got our drywall. Then we've got usually a latex paint on the inside. Now on its face, maybe you don't think much of this, but let's just take a look at kind of how some of these products breathe, right? Here I've got permeabilities. These are the numbers that just judge how well vapor can move through something, all right? On our old wall, starting on the outside with our wood siding, uh, wood siding has a permeability of 10 to 30, all right? Whereas vinyl siding has a zero. You know, that's why your pipes are made from it. It is waterproof, essentially. Let's move on to the next layer, all right? On the old house, we've got a layer of plank, maybe, but also the siding might have just been attached straight to the studs. Now, I can imagine all these little gaps. There's a lot of air moving through there. And on top of that, wood can be quite permeable, whereas on the new house, we usually have some type of vapor layer here, where, whether it's Tyvek, which is quite open. But then we usually have something like OSB, oriented strand board, the ground up chips turned into sheets of essentially plywood. It has a permeability rating of 8 to 10, which is not incredibly low, but it's definitely lower than what natural wood would be. Moving inside of our stud bay before we had nothing in here, now we've got some type of insulation. So fiberglass is very common, but you could also have spray foam, you could have cellulose. Regardless of what it is, even if it's vapor open, the air cannot move freely inside of the wall cavity now. Moving past the wall cavity, at least here in the Midwest, this is where we do our vapor barrier. So if you have fiberglass, you might either have just the paper facing that's stapled up to the studs, or you could have like a, a polyethylene sheet, all right? Batch with the face on it, the fiberglass has a one to five permeability. Poly sheet has a 0 0.05, you know, it, it's barely permeable. It's very, very moisture trapping. And then from there, we've got our drywall and our latex based paint. Now, I've heard builders on YouTube talk about how drywall breathes very well. This is a lie. It does not breathe very well. Let me tell you why it's a lie. It's got this 30 to 50 perm rating. If you just look up what is drywall's perm rating, but what does that leave out? It leaves out the paint, guys. You're putting two to three coats of latex based paint on that. And if you have an older house that's not brand new, you might have five, six, seven layers of latex-based paint. These are layers of plastic. You're reducing how well the water can move through. So that's going to go down to like two to three or even lower, depending on how much you put on there. On the inside of our old house, what do we have? We have that lath, which is just there are big gaps in it. So it's not really a player in this at all. Then we have our lime-based plaster. And lime-based plaster was incredibly good and allowing vapor to come through it, all right? We've got 30 to 80 permeability, which is awesome, all right? So in this old wall cavity, we've got air that can move, 
and it can also move through the materials. So you may have an old house that was leaky, but if it's never been renovated, it's never had this junk added to it, it may not even have mold in the walls if it's leaking. Whereas with the new style of building, if you do get a leak in here, which at some point every house is gonna have a leak, all right, that air is not moving around and it's also not able to move through a bunch of these different products here. So you're gonna be stuck with a dark, damp environment and that is what mold loves. The second big reason that we struggle with mold today is that we use air conditioning. We didn't used to have air conditioning and air conditioning is awesome, but what you're doing is you're pumping in really, really cold air to try to bring your space down to, you know, whatever, 68, 70 degrees. You're using an air that's much colder than that. And what happens is it cools off parts of your house to below the dew point, meaning that condensation will form on them. So this might be the ducts themselves. It might be inside of the wall cavity and dripping off the duct getting on your drywall, et cetera, and that can really lead to mold. And the last and probably most overlooked reason that we get mold today when we didn't is our synthetic and engineered products that we didn't use to use, all right? Back 100 years ago, almost everything could quite easily be traced to whatever it came from naturally, okay? Let's talk our wood first. Our frame, you know, it is made from just dimensional lumber, and then we don't have any engineered products at all. So our subfloor, it's planks. Our walls, they're plank. Our ceiling, it's plank. Everything is made from just lumber. Nothing is glued together, all right? On my new house, though, I've got way, way less just normal wood, all right? My two by fours and my roof framing, a lot of that stuff is probably just regular wood, but all of my sheathing products are now OSB or plywood, and OSB is ground up wood chips, meaning we've started the DK process and then we've glued it all together and called it a sheathing product, all right? Plywood is a little better, but again, we've broken the size down of the tree, we've glued it together, and those glues can feed the mold as well as thin stuff molds, decays, rots much faster than thick stuff. In our framing, we've got TJI joists, LVL joists, both synthetic products. We've got the whole thing wrapped in OSB. We've got it on the subfloors of both levels. We've usually got it up here. We've got it on our walls. It's everywhere. For our finishes, it's the exact same thing. Back here, what do we got? We got natural wood trim. We've got natural wood cabinets. We've got natural wood floors. It's all just solid wood. Whereas we move to the newer house, we're gonna have synthetic and engineered products everywhere inside the wood finishes, all right? What looks like wood baseboard is oftentimes MDF, medium density fiberboard. It's ground up wood particles glued together. For our cabinets, we'll have low density fiberboard, also known as particle board. Very similar, just lower density. For our wood floors, even if we have real wood, a lot of times it's over an engineered backing. It's over a plywood backing. And an engineered wood floor is not a bad product, all right? Don't get me wrong. It's definitely way better than having like a laminate or a vinyl floor. Vinyl floors are literally the worst you can have. Don't ever have one of these guys. They trap moisture underneath, all right? They have cracks in between them where the moisture gets down or it comes up through the slab underneath and then it's trapped because it cannot dry. And there's a whole bunch of other health effects that are related to PVC and vinyl in your house on top of that. Our doors, even if they are solid, are oftentimes a solid MDF core in them. Maybe they have a real wood laminate on the outside. And this goes on and on with all of the products that used to just be wood. And the common theme with all of these engineered and synthetic wood products is that they all contain a bunch of glue, which can feed the mold. And we've already started them on their breakdown process. We've made them thin, we've made them small to where they can turn back into earth much more quickly. They don't dry well like the original wood product does. Why does a real wood floor swell and shrink worse than an engineered one? Because it's better at drying itself out, all right? These fake wood products don't do that nearly as well. They trap moisture, they don't let it out as easily, and they can lead to mold growth behind them very easily. Moving on to our walls inside the house. This old house, it is made from lime plaster on the inside, almost guaranteed, all right? Lime plaster breathes super well. It's also very tough, which is super nice compared to drywall, all right? In the new house, we've got drywall, which, it, you know, the middle is gypsum, which is natural, but on the outside, we've got paper, all right? Mold loves paper, and it doesn't breathe, guys, all right? It's always painted, and because it's painted, it's not actually that permeable. And lastly, guys, we've got the outside of the house. If you had an old house, this layer could breathe because it was made from things that were very close to their natural form, all right? If we had wood, we know that breathes great. If we had stucco, we had a lime-based stucco, whereas today, all the stuccos are Portland cement-based. Portland cement is just 
the compound we use to make all of the cement products that you see around today. And it's an amazing product, but it doesn't breathe like lime-based products used to breathe. So your masonry products today are pretty much all going to be made from that Portland cement that doesn't breathe, whereas the old ones were made from lime, which does breathe. On the outside of our new house, it's almost always synthetic today, all right? We've got our vinyl siding, doesn't breathe at all. We might have hardy board, you know, which is essentially cement siding planks. And you know, we just learned that cement doesn't breathe very well. Uh, we might have stucco. And if we do have stucco, well, it may look very similar to old stuccos. It is Portland cement based. So we're not going to have that breathability on the outside of the house. So guys, this video is not to poo poo on new houses. All right. Although I did, I did a lot. All right. But new houses don't have to be built poorly. They don't have to be built with all these synthetic products. I think that using some of the technology that we've got now, but also using a lot of the natural products of old is the way to build new. But if you're interested in avoiding mold in your home, I've got a video popping up on the screen that is the five building designs that almost guarantee that you will have mold. So go ahead and click on that now and watch it. Thanks for watching.